Our next talk for the day is an academic feature by Professor Vijay Kumar on opportunities in innovative educational practices enabled by the cloud-based approach. Professor Vijay Kumar is the Senior Strategic Advisor for Digital Learning and Director OEIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Professor Vijay provides leadership for sustainable technology-enabled educational innovation at MIT. In his prior roles at MIT as Senior Associate Dean of Undergraduate Education, Assistant Provost and Director of Ac Academic Computing, as, as well at other institutions, Professor Vijay has been responsibly, responsible for strategic development and leading units engaged in the effective integration of information technology and media services in education. Professor Vijay is a member of the advisory committee of MIT OpenCourseWare. He is the executive officer for MIT's Council of Educational Technology. Welcome, Professor. Good morning. It's wonderful to be here. Thank you for the invitation and, uh, um, and you know, for this very, very uh, timely uh, themed uh, conference. And uh, you know, I just wanted to pick up. A, it's timely because you know, I was talking with uh, Dean Zanjnekar uh, before the meeting started this morning and uh, uh, st telling him about how at MIT, uh, we are really looking at this centrality of these things, digital uh, things that might be uh, you know, proxied as a cloud. And to think about very, very profound transformations in education, uh, our president has you know, made several pronouncements saying, you know, when we look at MIT five years, it's going to be uh, you know, uh, nothing like what we see it now. And we are, being, we are beginning to see various aspects of the transformation. And that's why many of the themes or topics that have been identified you know, uh, uh, for this conference are so, so very relevant. Uh, I was, uh, you know, listening to, to Rajan Anand, you know, the previous uh, uh, keynote, and uh, a couple of things struck me. One is uh, uh, a message which was sort of lingering in his comments, which is that the, you know, which is an old statement from Yogi Berra, you know, the, the baseball thing, which is that the future ain't what it used to be. You know? So there's a lot of that going on right now. Uh, I was, I'm also reminded, you know, my, 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 my doctoral work is in an area called Future Studies in Education. And uh, in our school of Future Studies, we used to say that we were not in the business of forecasting the future, <coughs> excuse me, rather, uh, we were in the business of creating preferred futures or making preferred futures more possible for others. And I think when we look at all the affordances, the influences of things digital, uh, we can sit silently and have things be done upon us, or we can harness it to, in some cases, retain the kinds of things that we value. I was struck by the question that had come up earlier on about distraction and uh, about you know, machine interactions, and which made me think, well, for our education, we might really think about what are the things that we hold very dear that we think are invariants, and uh, uh, not just give that away, but see how we might want to leverage the technology affordances that are present to us in order to amplify them or extend that, extend that to audiences that we typically don't serve. And that's a large focus of education technology at MIT. Um, I, uh, so I, th I think we can create preferred futures based on the kinds of things that we see for the context that we are in, uh, rather than uh, haplessly be subject to the influences that come upon us. You know? So that's, and, and as educators, I think we can do this, and most importantly, we can enable our colleagues and future generations to do that. And, and that is heck of a responsibility, but that's hell of an opportunity too. So, um, when I think, when I, when I saw the cloud theme, you know, I was corresponding with, uh, with Amit and Rima and the organizer and Arun about the theme of the conference. And you know, they said, well, you know, we're talking a lot about the cloud. And uh, so forgive my silly puns now and then, I couldn't, can't resist it, you know, about things like being clouded and you know, things being forecast. But uh, when I think about the, the cloud's been around in various ways for quite some time, for a few years. And there are some things that you read, you know, when typically when a few years ago when the notion of the cloud started surfacing in a manner of speaking, 
uh, you know, two dominant things that were talked about were virtualization and uh, software as services. You know, and virtualization, the immediate impact was saying, look, we can talk about gadgets, we can talk about thin clients, we can talk about things like netbooks, and you see, you know, these examples that are picked from the Horizon Report of the New Media Consortium from 2013. So, you know, the kinds of things that were going on because of what the cloud was enabling, a lot of services to be shared, and so this became that, becomes that, and becomes this, as you heard uh, very eloquently in the, in the previous presentation. But the fact that these are being deployed which changes the infrastructure for education, and that was there. When I think about the cloud, I think about these two very, very potent influences as, you know, uh, which I think are very generative influences, and I say generative because they, they lead to good things happening, dip different kinds of things. These two generative influences whose confluence, I think, represents the kinds of, some tremendous innovative possibilities for education. So one of those influences which I generally largely cast as the technology influence, largely represented by networks, uh, networks and networks, uh, again, being a proxy for devices, the software, the architecture. And you know, under that, I've listed a whole bunch of these technologies. And by the way, that list also, uh, uh, is a list, there is a group that I work with called the New Media Consortium, and every year it puts out what's called the Horizon Report, you know, which says, you know, uh, one year horizon, two year horizon, four year horizons, what are the technologies and how will they impact education? And uh, so that list is from the 2013 2014 list. And some of these you heard mentioned in the, in the session earlier. And, but when I think about technology, I'm again asking you to think generously of that term, uh, thinking of it as hardware, software, processes, uh, architecture, which I'm very big on open architecture. And, but here are some of the kinds of things when we think about the cloud, some of the technologies that are beginning to have a much more dominant role in how we uh, think about education. And by the way, the, uh, I mean, just uh, one of the transformations that we see, and again, uh, picking up a note from the earlier presentation, uh, you know, uh, Anand was talking about the change in the behavior of the consumer. And when I think about the education sector, that is what we are seeing also, a tremendous change in the, in the educational consumer, if you can call that, you know, and one of the most significant aspects of the change is that it's no longer all push, it's no longer all supply side. You know? It's a lot of pull, it's a lot of demand driven education. And demand not in some silly, frivolous way, you know, people want to craft different kinds of pathways, they want to customize what they get, and they, you know, they want to be able to have choice. You know? Uh, so, which is, and, and, you know, and this potent combination of technology and this other dimension for me, which uh, expresses a cloud openness, uh, all lead to different kinds of pathways, different kinds of choice, and some very, very foundational, fundamental transformations. Again, when I say open, and every time I talk about, uh, give a talk on technology and open, I like I make a request for all of you also to think very generously about the term open. Open is not just open content, but all these things, open tools, open applications, open architecture, and these enablers, you know, the legal and policy enablers, which are a large part of why open can be open, you know, whether it's licenses like Creative Commons, uh, so the legal and policy enablers, without which, you know, it's sort of not really open. Now, what I do believe is that this confluence can lead to profound transformations. And uh, the kinds of things it makes possible are when you look at technology and open interacting, intersecting, uh, it allows us some very, very interesting kinds of connections uh, to lots of content, uh, to different kinds of experiences, learning educational experiences, uh, to different kinds of learning opportunities, the new pathways and new choice. One of the things we often uh, don't say out, although we all talk about social networks, and is the connectivity connects us to different kinds of communities, right? And, and the community becomes a very, very important player in this ecosystem, both from the provision side as well as the consuming side of education. So it's networks and open, providing lots of content, lots of experience, lots of learning opportunities, lots of communities, and data 
data in a very unprecedented way, and you, I mean, there's, there are sessions on uh, big data over here, uh, data about where people are learning, how they are learning, how everything from clickstream data to lots of macro data about how institutions might be performing. So suddenly we have, uh, you know, enormous quantities of data that can help us modulate what we build, what we offer, when we offer, and so on. So this is, so it's these two forces leading to this kind of, uh, these kinds of uh, influences that really are very, very transformative. And what I hope to do today is give you some glimpses of uh, projects that I'm associated with from the MIT context uh, largely, and I will apologize in, uh, in advance. Many of them are science and engineering uh, uh, examples. You know, it's, uh, it's uh, um, what shall I say, it's a condition because of where I come from. <laughs> and uh, uh, although we like to say that, you know, we have a great political science school, we have a great music school, and we have a great business school. Uh, but lots of engineering and science examples because I work very closely in that, in that domain. I, what I would like to do is in, to illuminate the transformative possibilities that are hinted by the confluence of technology and open in this very, very clouded world. So open, when we talk, we start again, I say this a million times, we start with open courseware, lots of content in the cloud. This is uh, all of MIT's courses being available progressively since 2000 when we made this rash claim to to now when there are upwards of 2,100 courses from, uh, uh, from, uh, uh, um, from M uh, you know, all of MIT's courses being available on the web for free uh, uh, for the world to be used for educational purposes. And why we think this is a significant uh, uh, influence is not just because MIT has 2,100 courses, but what immediately followed in the aftermath was that there are upwards of 250 institutions who form the Open Courseware Consortium, who have, so they have 13,000 some courses, they're all available for, you know, courses of different kinds from around the world, and so that's the big open force in, you know, the, you know, the influence of content that's available uh, in the cloud for all of us. Then, uh, Following that, we have other kinds of things, They're very, very focused initiatives, open learning initiative from Carnegie Mellon, you know, software initiatives, all kinds of things that express openness in terms of content, in terms of learning experiences. And they've had tremendous influence. They have, for instance, when we look at OCW, you know, sometimes uh, it's hard to fathom. We look at the data, you know, and you say, my God, you know, the millions of users since 2000 who consistently keep coming, new years, users of different kinds, educators. Uh, uh, I, 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 I like to tell the story of uh, uh, how there was a spike in the early days of uh, open courseware. We were looking at the website and there were lots of hits and suddenly there was a big spike in the hits and we wondered what happened. And later on when we analyzed it, it's because at that time we saw that there was a dot-com bust in the, in the Bay Area, in the, in the Valley, and there are lots of people who were with, you know, without jobs and they said, let's use the opportunity to do some knowledge updates, knowledge upgrades, and they were coming back to the site. You know? So there were continuous education possibilities and then there are possibilities like this. So there are lots of course and lots of people uh, you know, getting to these for different kinds of learning reasons, which is the pull part also. You have young people like this uh, who you know, use this as supplements. There are faculty who are using the models very early on in OCW's life. I remember I was giving a talk and somebody said, where does MIT get off telling the world how to teach? And I said, well, we're not telling anybody how to teach. We're just giving you a picture of what we teach and it's out there. And it's also a very important statement relating to the question that was asked about behavior uh, in the earlier session. When MIT launched open courseware, there was a lot of faculty discussion following a charge that our president and provost gave us at the time saying, look, you know, uh, the internet's here. The, we have, uh, you know, uh, Stanford, Chicago, everyone's launching a content.com kind of initiative. What are we doing? Have we missed the boat? Has the train left the station? And we talked about it and we said, look, uh, if we need to respond you know, to what we can do with the internet, we should really think about our core value proposition. And we talked, and in typical MIT terms, you know, faculty said, oh, the MIT education is about intensity and drinking from the fire hose, lots of stuff. And we said, yeah, 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 what does that mean? Till people were able to articulate that what it meant was that excellence in that education came from a very high bandwidth of interaction between great students and great faculty and by providing lots of research-like experiences in undergraduate education. So if we said at that time, the only way we knew how to do that 
is in face-to-face -face education. This is circa 1999. So we said, well, the best thing we can do is take a picture of that and put it out there. That's open courseware. So it was actually a very good statement of humility, but thinking very carefully about what your core value proposition. Times have changed. Now we have edX, we have stuff we have launched, you know, where we said, no, we can do these kinds of things because there are these new affordances of technology, there are networks, there are all these new kinds of education technology tools. And so uh, two years ago, following the trajectory of this open movement, but again, keeping our value proposition quite uh, carefully, clearly in mind, acutely in mind, uh, Harvard and MIT partnered to launch edX. And, uh, uh, you know, and uh, what can I say? It sounds like the McDonald metrics, which is millions of people served, you know, lots and lots of uh, people, lots of courses. And, but the interesting thing is, again, it was saying that we have this, we can create courses that lots of people, we can uh, extend uh, high quality education to audiences that we typically do not serve, who do not come into MIT. But at the same time, it is a very, very significant opportunity for us to shine a mirror on ourselves because it tells us about things that we can improve in MIT education. You know, for instance, making it much more blended, trying to see how we can judiciously combine on-site and online education to do the kinds of things that we value, more hands-on experiences, more research-like experiences. And by the way, we have data to show that it's really early data to show that it's really significantly positively impacting education as we care about it. So edX was launched, and uh, what is unique is this uh, scale, you know, I mean, we were talking about uh, uh, you know, factors, uh, orders of magnitude before, you know, uh, more than uh, uh, three sigma differences. But so there's lots of so scales and thousands and thousands of simultaneous partner, partners. And this notion of communities, which is a very interesting thing. When uh, Anant Agarwal did, and uh, his colleagues did the first course, uh, when they launched edX, when Anant launched edX and, you know, they did this uh, circuits course, the going in proposition is that there are three instructors and 300,000 students. And what they find within two weeks is there are lots and lots of communities that are forming, which are helping to learn, you know, a lot of peer learning that's going on. So it's suddenly you see that it's not a one-to-many, but a many-to-many -many interaction that is happening. And so that ecology of that educational practice is changing, right? So communities, so what was unique was not just the, this multiplicative factor, you know, sounds more like an exponential factor, but the fact that the way education was being conducted was being changed, and it was being informed not just by what technology was, but, 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 but what learning sciences were saying, you know, short video clips, uh, which, uh, you know, which, you know, because there's a lot of research, we say that, you know, it says that the lecture, for instance, and I hope I, you don't prove it here, that the lecture in terms of brain activity is the worst kind of activity because after 30 minutes or so, you know, you can see the brain activity sort of goes down and settles down at a very low asymptote. You know? So seven minutes, and, and then attention span, so you want to make sure there are short video segments. All these things were unique about the experience that was being offered online. It was not distance education online as many of us were familiar with, I certainly was, uh, uh, both from here and my, my own research work, which was, you know, stage on stage, lots of people out there, or even online, just, uh, just taking what you do over here and putting it online. No, this was a different kind. It was trying to rethink pedagogy, looking at what technology was bringing, looking at networks, communities, short video clips, lots of analytics and data, and I'll show you some of those things. And one of the most interesting things was when you leverage these communities where you leverage data, you were able to have very, very tight feedback loops, you know, which changed the nature of the education process itself. You know. So. The, the very interesting thing that we really liked, you know, just like in the case of OCW, was unanticipated education was happening. Suddenly you hear that this group in Mongolia, this bunch of kids, found the edX course, they had taken it, because they were looking at it to solve some projects, you know, because to look for solutions for some projects that they were doing. So there was unanticipated education that was going on. I already answered my question about where is this. Uh, normally, I would have asked you the question and you would have all responded by saying Mongolia. Yes, it is Mongolia over there. Now, the thing over here, for instance, is 
Okay, so you see this uh, amazing thing happening? And the key is that the stable point is when V plus equals V minus. Okay, it's not exactly equal. Okay, it's more or less equal to uh, each other. Okay, V plus more or less equal to V minus. So, you know, so when we talked about edX, it was not just short seven minute video clips of the lecture, but you could have this kind of face to face thing that we do in a, uh, in a classroom also as part of that exercise. But I mean, you could, you could explain a concept, for instance, let's say electromagnetism, and then uh, you could immediately elaborate it with the simulation. So you had a short video clip uh, followed by a face-to-face -face kind of lecture, by a simulation, or, you know, which, if it was a tough concept and that came immediately after the course, or, or uh, and these are not just visualizations, there are different kinds of visualizations. For, for instance, for introductory biology, we are, for introductory genetics, we have created visualizations that can be included as part of introductory biology course, where there's a lot of interaction with images so that people understand some concepts pretty profoundly. I think I'll, uh, I'll bypass this video. It's a wonderful little clip which talks about how uh, students actually grab a DNA molecule. You know, uh, 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 it's all browser-based access. They grab a DNA molecule. They can have, they have tools to measure it and then they can reach, Cornell has an open protein database, they can, they can grab a molecule, they can make comparisons. So it's not just about eye candy or showing pretty pictures, but very empowering, interactive, engaging experiences that are embedded within a course. So when you confront a con concept, immediately after that, if it's a tough, tough concept, there's an elaboration, there's a video clip. By the way, you can look at that site, the star software that was created, which is talking about the cloud, uh, all this is available openly at that site, these, these, uh, uh, these simulations. Star Biochem has had 400,000 downloads around the world in the last two years because people take the visualization, and these are pretty profound visualizations. They build lesson plans and courses around them. So this is what happens. There's, you, you put out this resource in the cloud, there are all kinds of contextualized learning experiences that are created. So that's how the ecosystem of educational opportunity is changing. And people create, so it's not about looking at what MIT is doing, but looking at something, you know, this is worldwide that, that is done, for which a lot of thinking has gone on from, you know, from genetics faculty, from postdocs, et cetera, from uh, parts of my team who's developed visualizations, these visualizations. But you put it out there along with your own lesson plans and people create, and there's an increasing repository of different kinds of lesson plans that are created around these assets. So that's, that's the kind of stuff that's happening. But here, uh, here you see another thing that is where you might do the video clip followed by a visualization, but you have a quick apply place where this is from an uncircuit course where uh, you might have some tests immediately after that, or in this case, well, it's a chemistry course where immediately after a chemistry segment, you, know, you, you, will, you will have an autograded exercise to see if you have grokked that concept or not. Uh, you could have uh, a virtual game like uh, this thing, uh, laboratory online, where you test out the simulation that you have done. So you have this place where people put, they create their own circuits over there, they apply the principles that they have learned, and all this is happening as part of the online course. In fact, this was from the first course that was, that was offered. So what you're seeing actually is, uh, and then you, know, you, you do a test, and there is immediate feedback for that, and then you get to see if it is right or wrong. So if you look, just look at the construction, deconstruct that exercise, what happens? You have a video clip, you have a lecture, you have a simulation or visualizations that elaborates a concept. You, you apply the theory in a test-like situation and you're tested. Now, in, you know, you, you, we talk about Bloom's taxonomy in education, you know, learn, apply, and so on. In our typical education model, there is too much latency between when you learn something, when you apply something. So in many cases, it's out of sight, out of mind. You know? So here, what you're trying to do is this is allowing us to bring the learn, the apply, the test, and the feedback immediately, right? Much more proximally, uh, you know, closer to each other. 
and we are beginning to see some very serious learn, learning gains because of this. I mean, we talk about lab kinds of exercises also, which we'd always used to do much later, if at all, from when we were exposed to the theory. And this allows you to get, bring in just-in-time influences, and all this is being done to the scales of thousands and thousands of users. So that's what is unique, that is what is different about this kind of education. Okay. Now, I, I just had these couple of slides to show you that the kinds of stuff that I'm talking about, resources in the cloud, uh, this business of online education, this conference of open and technology, is not just for higher education. There are lots and lots of resources in the K through 12 environment. This particular sets of simulation, I know it's very widely used in India also. I've been working with a lot of educators uh, here uh, on some school projects. This was created by Carl Wyman's group uh, in, when he was at the University of Colorado. Carl, Carl Wyman was a Nobel laureate uh, physicist from uh, five years ago. And he and his group created these simulations. He calls them using science to teach science. So these are visual simulations that have been very, very heavily tested. They have been evaluated in terms of their efficacy. And they are put out, this group puts them out. They're translated into multiple languages. In fact, I do a project with educators in Haiti where these FET simulations are, are created. And what is wonderful about the Haiti project is that we have these things translated in Creole, and the educators over there are producing visualizations and making them available through this FET site also. So there's a lot of bidirectionality to this. So it's not just in the higher education world, it's in the K through 12 world also. So we have all this, and if you think about that blue tree that I had, I talked about experiences. And one of the things that always comes up when we think about these online experiences is, is that it's all great access to content, but what about these things that we care about? MIT, for instance, believes a lot in first-hand experiences and laboratory experiences. Now, this iLab project, and again, I talk about this quite a bit, uh, is uh, the creation of the gentleman over there, Jesus de Alamos, who's a professor uh, uh, in electrical engineering, and this allows browser-based access to real laboratories. So network analyzer equipment, seismographic equipment, what you have is browser-based access where you set parameters on real equipment. So these are not simulations and visualizations. These are actual labs that are used, uh, and you have access to them. We have students from Singapore, from Sweden, etc., who access our labs. But the interesting thing about iLabs is not the six or seven labs at MIT that people have access to. It's an open architecture that allows anyone. We did a project here in Hyderabad uh, three years ago when there was an, when there was an uh, iLab uh, uh, implementation done over here. In 2007, I had uh, President Abdul Kalam come to TIFR, where this was an early stage project, and he actually ran an iLab experiment at MIT at, the, at that conference. So this is, the open architecture allows you to create labs anywhere and have browser-based access to them. In fact, uh, there are more iLabs around the world than at MIT. Our own, in, you know, there's a simple harmonic motion equipment, the, the inverted pendulum experiment. We use the one that is created in Queensland. So uh, the notion is, again, extensive opportunity for hands-on experience. So when you think about the innovative possibilities over here, it's not just about access to lectures, but access to different kinds, as I was showing, much more profound educational experience of scale, but end-to-end. -end. So, uh, uh, so yeah, in fact, uh, I, I just saw this slide last night. Last two days, just before I left MIT, we were having, having a learning with MOOCs conference at MIT. And uh, uh, um, uh, Garvit from, uh, from Berkeley, he was demonstrating his remote labs you know, and uh, using a robot. So, I, you know, I, I, uh, so this is a virtual lab. So when you start looking at, uh, we have a partnership with the Chicago School where school kids, are, we have a benign nuclear plant at MIT. So where students actually, they look, K through 12 students look at the neutrons, et cetera. It's becoming part of their experience. Our nuclear engineering, our mechanical engineering students use data from this. They don't go there. They use the iLab uh, setup to actually access real lab experiments with the nuclear facility. So when you look at this and possibilities like this, where, uh, for instance, there are uh, telescopes that are mounted in Hawaii to which students have access, and they not only have access to the telescopes through the network, they have experts. 
at uh, Lawrence Berkeley in Berkeley, in a uh, uh, lab in Berkeley, who are available to talk to these students. So it's access to the laboratories, access to sophisticated equipment, and also access to experts around this. One of the things that we see uh, happening with these kinds of lab experiences, you have students from Singapore, Sweden, et cetera, like I said, you know, who are accessing. They compare the results, the interpretation of the results based on the context that they are coming from. You know? And that itself is a very, very uh, interesting kind of an education experience. The other thing is, when, you, when I look at things like iLabs, it is not just about access to expensive equipment, but the fact that you can actually share a configuration of a lab across multiple users. You can multiplex it across many, many users. Typically, you find, you know, when at least this was my experience, two things would happen when I was doing engineering or science in school. You know. One is we may or may not have a lab related to a topic. But even if we had, it was guaranteed that it was never there when we learned the theory. It was you know, it was way months later, and in most cases, and I have no shame in admitting this, most of my lab experiences were re-engineering exercises. I always knew what the value of G was, I knew what the focal length was, and I worked backwards, right? Here, so you're able to bring that just-in-timeness into, into the thing. So latency decreases. So you look, if you look at the cost of that education experience, you're really diminishing it quite considerably, quite significantly. Now, there are things like, uh, you know, uh, like Scratch, et cetera, these programming languages that are available on the network for people to construct. But Fab Labs, where you talk, you know, nowadays, how many of you have heard of the maker movement? Okay, we have, well, we have five or six hands. So there's a lot of construction activity that's going on. People are building things. People are building circuits. Build, and, and then now with 3D printing, you know, suddenly the maker movement has re, uh, uh, gained a lot of significance. But what you're doing through this Fab Labs kind of stuff is providing digital experiences all around, around the world. So when you look at, and, you know, and these are being done in schools. So what I like to say is when you look at iLab, when you look at Fab Labs, when you look at the circuits uh, kind of experiments that I showed from uh, Anand's course, and you look, and, and the star kinds of simulations, and you look at the whole thing as an ecosystem of hands-on experiences, of real lab experiences, you suddenly see the profound possibilities. So that for different kinds of learners, for different kinds of situation, you have this whole compendium of hands-on lab kinds of experiences that you can choose and bring to necessarily complement this other education experience that comes through talk, you know, through talk and talk, uh, through video-based stuff and through access to content. So you're really looking at a very, very rich online experience. This is uh, uh, the Blossoms project, which has been around for quite a while. And what is interesting, and this speaks to context also, where people, there's a whole repository of interactive video lessons that have been created in different countries by folks over there on very, very authentic uh, experiences that are happening over there. And Blossom stands for blended. The, the important word in Blossoms is B. It is blended learning and it's open source and education for science and math. Right. So you have all these videos that have been created and authentic learning things, videos by, uh, you know, by people in Jordan, by people in Pakistan, by people, people in India, you name it, all over, they create these. And there is a pedagogy around it where you play the video and there is an interactive exercise, that, a blended exercise that goes along with it. So the videos and a set of recommended exercises are all available where in the cloud. And people are using it for different kinds of learning experiences. Now. So this is what I was saying. If you think about this active learning ecosystem that is being created by these sets of possibilities, you, you, start, you can start imagining what, where we can move from where we are right now. You know? So some quick little peek at some of the technologies, and then I can, I can say where this might be going. So you saw edX, and you're, you're seeing that you know, there are a lot of emerging technologies. We're all sitting on the network. So when we talk about the network in the cloud, like I said, and it's about access to people, community content. We have PDF documents. We have our faculty member, uh, uh, Dave Carger, who has created this collaborative annotation tool. And others have come up in the market also, where we might all be sitting on a network. There is a document. Maybe it's an open course web page. 
uh, Rima's there, you, you look at it and she doesn't understand something, she, she annotates it. Somebody else goes there and says, oh, I understand. There's a lot of real-time cross-annotation that's going on on a document. You know? That's network learning that is happening at scale through these kinds of resources that are available, these kinds of tools. Uh, we are looking at large problems that can where we use the community to, for instance, uh, introductory, there's an, one of the introductory computer science courses, which has lots of people and lots of coding. So they have figured out ways to chunk out this code and give it to the community to do some peer grading and created mechanisms, both the workflow and the tools so that this can be managed. So you start using scale as an input and that's the real kicker over here, because typically we think about creating, so there was a lot of conversation this morning about scale, but we always think about scale as numbers to get to. And I think the real leap over here is that we can leverage scale as an input to create different kinds of learning experiences. So you start thinking about how can you leverage multiple communities, large numbers of people around the world. You start thinking about how you might start using lab setups that are widely available around the world in order to provide that. You start thinking about how you might do crowdsourcing in this clouded environment in order to bring different kinds of deeper learning experiences. Now, one of the things that we've been doing a lot which speaks to enabling the kind of, is modularity. And there's a tendency right now for us to start look, you know, disaggregating courses based on core concepts into modules. And we might do this for different purposes. Sometimes we do it because uh, we want, because, you know, let's say there's an introductory chemistry course. I might do the introductory chemistry course because I want to do, I become a chemical engineer, which I was, or I might do that because it's part of my pre-med track. I want to have a different pathway. So just along the uh, a concept, I can create different kinds of learning experiences, some that speak to my motivation to be uh, a pre-med student. Some might be tailored to, because I'm interested in advanced chemical engineering. Some, might, some people might say, look, I learn better when I see lab experiences around it. So might, we might have videos around a particular topic. So we are creating different pathways based on modular education. In many cases, it's to provide the flexibility. We say that, look, we want our students to go to Cambridge, we want them to go to Singapore, and we have programs with all these people. But when our students go there, they feel disconnected. They feel like they're losing something from their educational experience over here. So we modularize these courses, and it's available, so that people can take these modules flexibly, so the cost of being away is not forbidding, and they are encouraged to go out. So we have, and you know, we have some very poignant stories that have really, uh, they have been impacted, you know, where students have been impacted by this flexibility that they have in taking segments of their course and not feeling like if they engage in some other experience, they have to lo lose out on their primary educational experience. So, uh, and, and of course, you know, we are building infrastructure. We have something called the Core Concept Catalog, which allows people to create links between concepts and assets, and then remember these links when you're creating a new course. So we are creating infrastructure so that these kinds of things are not done as one-offs, but, but can be uh, done at scale. So I was saying, I'm, I'm, I'm going to close off over here. I was saying that, look, you know, we do this, and there are blended possibilities, and you know, to remember what we care about when we think about these innovative possibilities. So, this, this introductory chemistry course used a lot of edX online materials. It used a lot of edX, uh, and it used a lot of online assessments. But it was a course that was done on site. And, one of the, and it was modularized. And one of the things that we found, if you look at this graph keenly, you can see in all the learning outcomes, because of this rapid feedback kind of stuff, because people could take online exams, and if they didn't do well, you know, they were timed out for a while. They, could, they quickly got the feedback. They could come back and take it again. They were in each of the concepts, their mastery was very, very high. So if you compare, for instance, uh, the 2012, the blue line with uh, the green line, right? The number of people who got full credit on these concepts you can see in 2012. And when we didn't have this blended experience, and now you look at the green line for each of these concepts, the number of people who got full credit based on the blended experience. I mean, that is significant difference. 
And that speaks to us because he said, look, this is what we want. We want that kind of mastery. We want people to understand the concepts. So this is not just about putting it out there in millions. You know? We are leveraging the cloud to advance what we think is very, very important over here. So we are saying, how can we prudently combine on-site, online, physical, virtual, in order to provide very, very rich, uh, interesting, uh, deep learning experiences? So that's the name of the game. So what do we have here? We have, like I've been claiming for some time, the, uh, we are really seeing, because of this, uh, this convergence of the intersection of, of open and technology, you know, reflected through the cloud, we have this notion of abundance. You know. We have abundant resources. You have seen the open courseware, the learning experiences. We're providing different pathways to, uh, uh, for people to get to their learning goals. Uh, this blended, interesting blends, the customization. Uh, like I said in the Bay Area case, the continuous education possibilities, you can pop in for knowledge updates, for knowledge improvement. So you, you have much more opportunities for continuous education. The abundant spot, like I said, I, and I, it's very important to emphasize, you also have now access to abundant data. So about, for instance, you know, we never anticipated this thing about communities. Now we are looking at how communities are forming, you know, how do they interact for different kinds of subjects, how can, they be, how can they scaffold each other's learning experiences? You're getting information like that. You look at pathways. Analytics is very, very, uh, you know, that's assessment and analytics are the holy grail of this business. And suddenly you have enormous amounts of data. And we have opportunity to instrument our massive online courses to find out, to get much more data about what are the pathways people are taking, including simple things like when they come to a page, where did they come from and where, they, where are they going? What is the frequency of that? Because it either tells you that there is something in the, in the value chain of the learning experience that you need to pay more attention to, or perhaps there is some deficiency in the quality of the material that you have because they keep going back to some other resource. So there's a lot that you can learn uh, from, from analytics, from the data that's available. Uh, uh, lots of stuff on behavior, uh, how people are using videos, how people are uh, annotating videos. So one of the big abundance factors that plays into this. Look, uh, this is a little out of script comment. Well, most of my comments have been out of script. Um, I, so, you know, I, I was a systems analyst when I first came out of industrial management or whatever in, 19, uh, in 1978. One, and, you know, a lot of us were doing that, you know, we'd go and everybody wanted to automate their accounting system or their payroll system, right? And the only, then the thing is for if each one of these things, you have to study the existing system. And I can tell you in most cases, the benefit at that time at least was not automation, but the fact that you studied the existing system and you looked at how papers are flowing, how information is flowing. So the only consistent benefit that technology always brings, it allows you a very good fresh look at how you're doing things in the first place. You know? And that's what this is showing us, how we are doing things in the first place and where is the opportunity to change, where is the opportunity to tweak and improve in significant ways. You know? And that's where the data comes. So I've talked about this, the boundarylessness, the generative and so on. Uh, we have, I mean, this is, you know, I, I work with educators, I work with faculty at MIT, I work with teachers in India. So all this is, because I've, I've been using words like ecosystem and ecology, it does, uh, you know, it does, we were talking, you know, uh, the, uh, uh, Ajit, the dean and I were talking before and he was talking about the use of uh, video, for instance, right now, how intensive it has become. Uh, and so there's social media, there's video and all these technologies which are just becoming ubiquitously available. And these are, I mean, you know, you don't even have to look at some data to see the trending. If we just open our eyes and watch our own behavior, we can see what the trends are. But the implications are to rethink what we do. When we start looking, we said we cared a lot about hands-on learning and and uh, practical learning and high bandwidth of interaction. What we found at MIT, for instance, is that progressively over the years, we were removing ourselves from that. You know? There was too much content, there was a lot of lectures going on. You know? And suddenly we say that, look, you know, we have to change that behavior in order to get back what we profess we really cared about. And now we have the affordance, the opportunity to do so. So then we also think about considering that there are communities engaged in the teaching part 
learning is much more distributed, much more participatory. There are private and public providers in the supply side. There are different kinds of consumers you know, on, on, the, on the demand side. There are lots of implications we have, for instance, looking at all these implications. The, yeah, by the way, quick aside, what we found, and I'll, I'll come back to my previous point, what we are finding is this massive online courses. It's allowing us to go back to do what we really cared about, you know, the hands-on, authentic kind of learning, which is what we were able to do. Now, uh, and, and uh, are these kinds of things, you know, all these things which we cared about, which we talked a lot about, but the curriculum was so jam-packed, our practices had so become the other, moved ourselves from what we cared about, now we're able to get back to that. But going back to my previous point, there are all these influences, but it means a change in how we do the business of teaching and learning, uh, the practice of teaching and learning, sometimes retaining our core invariants, but sometimes thinking about what we have to change. And like I said, coming back to where I started, we are looking very hard at the centrality of this to create innovative opportunities for education. Um, if you get a chance, go to the MIT website. Uh, last week, the president announced a report from this. We had three task forces that were launched. This is, uh, I have not seen this level of engagement from MIT faculty in, you know, in, in, this, in this topic before. This is an institute-wide activity looking at uh, how residential education is changing, what are the influences, what we must look at, how global education changes. And when I say global education, it's not international education alone. Uh, right now, my role at MIT is I lead something called strategic education initiatives. We are thinking about, we work with community colleges with K through 12 because one of the obvious implications of this change is increased permeability between MIT and the other. You know, it, and it's not just your traditional pipeline as saying that, oh, your students are going to, or your products are going to become our product. It's because we see in that ecosystem there's going to be a lot of bi-directionality in exchange. We are building courses. We talk about stacked credentials with community colleges. We look at labor market data and see how can we map labor market data to concepts, to learning outcomes, to courses that we are providing so that people can see a much more direct path between where they want to go and what are the kinds of offerings. You know. So these are the kinds of strategic things that are beginning to happen. And then, of course, saying, in, given this new ecosystem and the new ecology, how do we run this? How do we, so there's a lot of thinking around uh, new business models for education. These are, like I said, the future ain't what it used to be. These are very, very exciting times. And you know, all I would do is encourage all of you to join the journey. Thank you. Take a few questions. Uh, hi, uh, great stuff. Uh, two questions which I have. One is, uh, what happens to the long-term courses when all this come comes back. up? So you offer a one-year, two-year, all those courses. So what are the implications for those courses in light of this? Secondly, how are you going to monetize it? Because university has to work on a revenue model. So how are you going to monetize all this so that the revenues keep coming in and uh, yeah. you're profitable? Yeah. Sure, sure. Uh, the first, so the first one, um, you know, when we talk about the long-term courses, you know, so one of the things we are saying that maybe all courses are not long-term courses that imagine. You rethink that whole package of offerings. The other thing is the example that I pointed from chemistry, you know. I mean, MITx is putting MIT's courses on the edX platform with other technologies. So we are rethinking our courses. Our faculty are engaged in rethinking how we offer all these new courses in light of these new affordances, right? So people come there, and so you say, what is the right mix of offerings? And you can, you, you know, you, you can think, do people do more courses, less courses? Uh, it's, I mean, th this is an MIT case, but I'll also tell you an example from, uh, from CMU. I had gone there a couple of years ago when they had done this open learning initiative, and I was talking to one of the mechanical engineering faculty. And open learning initiative, they use cognitive tutors and a lot of uh, 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 analytics in order to, uh, and one of the things that they found was that a 14-week statist introductory statistics course for the same learning outcomes they could do in seven weeks. So you say, oh, we've got more time. You know? So for the educational policy maker, it always raises the question, more time should I be expecting more research from my faculty? That's, you know, which is, which is something. Or when I went and talked to this faculty member, he says, look, Vijay, 
I've, I've been wanting to bring this kinds of hands-on experience, that kinds of, there's been no time in my class. Now I have the time to engage my students. So you're still approaching the same learning outcomes. You have a, you know, uh, you have new affordances or new ways of doing that. You know? So that's how, so you really rethink your courses. Even this concept-based stuff, concept mapping, uh, we are looking at courses and you have to start factoring your courses to see how they are tying to concepts, to learning outcomes, or assessments in these two year courses. We always did formative assessments. I mean, uh, um, uh, summative assessments, end of the semester, end of the year. Suddenly you're saying that you can embed assessments after every concept, micro assessments you can do and give feedback. You're still doing the same course, you're doing it differently and hoping that you'll get learning aids like that. As for monetizing it, the revenue model, the idea is always not monetizing it because that makes it sound like trade. How do you sustain this new practice? Is there a revenue model? And there are different revenue models in the edX case. You know, there are revenue models around certification, right? Uh, there's, there's that. Then there is also when we talk about uh, special online, you know, customized courses where you use the platform, but where you might not always have to go because uh, let's say the consortium of institutions, which is an edX, is offering courses. You can only take those courses when they are being offered. Whereas you could take that platform, we could have an arrangement with an institution, and you run stuff on that platform, but you run it on your schedule in, in the way that you want. So you build your business model around uh, uh, that kind of a practice. Then there are, I mean, from uh, there are edX kinds of questions where you know where there might be uh, the platform is open. Right? But you might have particular licensing model for special kinds of arrangements for customizations. So there is a variety of, of revenue models uh, uh, to be exercised. We face some of this with open uh, courseware also. The one thing that I do like to point out, as, and I'll put on my consultant educator hat, which is uh, we have to think about value on investment. So when we think about uh, monitor, when we think about cost and the, we, uh, this, we, we're not always looking at return on investment in traditional terms, okay? And I'll give you a very simple example, uh, and we'll get to your question also there. Uh, you know, we had introductory physics courses. We were talking about this over the break. Now, introductory physics is a course that every MIT student has to take, right? 600 students sitting in a lecture hall like that, and some, someone like me is lecturing, and, and uh, Meanwhile, you say, look, you know, we care about high bandwidth of interaction, hands-on, you know, all this stuff, you know. And we, you have 600 students, you know. How are you expressing your value proposition over there? So we looked at this studio physics, you know, where people are sitting around in tables, where they're actually doing hands-on experiments, where the you know, instructor goes, they're looking at lots of visualizations. In fact, the physics visualization is from a team. So what you did,